Thanks, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am Mary Ellen Slater. I'm the CEO and founder of RepCap, and I specialize in content marketing. And I am here today with my favorite demand gen marketer, Janelle Amos. And we are going to talk to you about demand gen versus lead gen. I said that demand gen is the most misunderstood term in marketing these days. And so I was really happy to have Janelle come on and we can just talk about it a little bit, like really kind of, like what do we mean by that word? Like we're going to start at that level. What does that word mean? And then we're going to talk about what it means in relationship to content. And then we're going to talk about some other factors. I think that a lot of times come up with like, let's say you're, you're sold, you believe in demand gen, you love all the content, you love that relationship. And then now how do you actually track and measure the impact of your work? Because these are the questions that Janelle and I get. And so real quick with me, as I mentioned, I'm at RepCap. I'm the founder, CEO. I run content strategy here. I'm also the publisher of managingeditor.com, which is a magazine and community for people who work in content marketing. And in a previous life, I was a traditional journalist. I wrote a career advice column for the Washington Post, where I was also a financial editor. Janelle, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your business? Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to have this talk today. I think it's one of the most popular questions and conversations that we have. Um, my name is Janelle Amos. I actually founded Elevate Growth not too long ago in December of 2021. Um, totally, completely switched from in-house to being a business owner. So it's been a fun couple of uh, quarters and months in. Um, I specialize in creating full funnel demand gen strategies that help B2B SaaS companies not only hit but exceed their revenue targets and ultimately kind of unify the marketing and sales alignment that most companies um, still struggle with today. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And thank you. And I want to just let everybody know that Janelle and I actually originally met when she was in house. So we worked together at Better Works initially, um, where she came to me and said, I need content for the things. And I said, I make content. And then at that point, like we were BFFs. <laughs> like, Since day one. Oh, geez. You have a plan? I have content. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so it was like that. It was like that. Um, so the first thing I actually want to talk to you about is the phrase demand gen. OK, because I think that demand gen gets tossed around and people have no idea like what that word actually means. And so I think, you know, you actually put it out as a call. So one, those of you in the chat, what is demand gen? Give me your wrong answers only. And then, Janelle, what are some of the wrong answers that people shared with you when you posted this very same question on LinkedIn? Yes. So I did make a post and I actually promoted the webinar, too, saying that everybody should also come here to listen to it because I will be calling out what their answers will be. Um, and some of my favorite ones that we have is demand gen is how many MQLs you can push per campaign. It's just another name for awareness campaigns. Mm, disagree. <laughs> It's only for paid channels mm -hmm. or it is sales at scale. Mm. That one's a good one. And my absolute favorite one, magic. The man gen is just magic. <laughs> See, Slightly I, true. I personally think it's whatever people of whatever people of different generations come up and demand at work. That's what I think it is. That's it's true. That was also <laughs> one of the comments there. <laughs> a generation after Gen Z, yes, they are demanding that we finally do something. Like, <laughs> ooh, something that people in other departments like to talk about. I mean, truly, is there any way if you want to sound like you're a hip marketer and you just want to like, well, obviously we're going to do demand gen and we're going to combine that with our ABM strategy and then, yeah, just just use those words. And you know what? You also use another word we should define as full funnel. What is a mm -hmm. full funnel demand gen? <laughs> like, all right. So let's say, I think, first of all, let's talk about what is demand gen, like for real. So let's start with that word demand. What do we mean by demand? When you say this, like, what, what does that mean? Yeah. So th this actually goes back to the term of like supply and demand. If we really scale it back and we talk about what is business as a whole, what is supply chain management, supply and demand means you have have actual products, actual services that you're supplying to for people who are actually in need, curious about, or want, right? So at a high level, if you break it down like supply and demand, right? So demand gen from a marketing perspective, it's a fundamental go-to-market approach that actually strips the marketing lens, strips the seller's hats, and puts all things consumer first. So another term that people have probably heard is customer centricity. 
So uh-huh. demand gen is a go-to-market approach where all departments are aligned in terms of saying, how can we make sure that whatever we produce, better content, whether landing pages, whether ads, whatever it is that gets produced as a company as a whole is taken into consideration with those consumers in mind. Uh-huh. Would a consumer go through this, right? And so really understanding that it's for the benefit of the consumer, not necessarily for businesses or for the teams or for leads, um, like a lead gen model would. Mm -hmm. And so how is that? So you say a lead gen model. How, when we say demand gen, and then we say lead gen, I think when people hear gen in those, they think that they're somehow related. But a demand gen model for marketing and sales, I really say for revenue, because I consider that a full revenue strategy is very different from a lead gen, like lead gen. So what does that mean? Why is that different? Yeah, so demand generation and lead generation vary by that fundamental approach, right? That fundamental go-to-market approach. So in essence, they're both generating items. One is generating demand, one is generating leads. And so when we talk about demand gen, there's two ways that we like to describe it, or I like to describe it. It's capturing demand and creating demand. So you have to do both things in your go-to-market strategy, where one, capturing is, think of things like your uh, Google form, um, your demo form on your website, right? It's things like the G2 um, reviews that are happening. It's your chat bot. It's people replying to your email. Anything at the point of like a conversion, right? That's all things capturing demand. Creating demand is telling the world that you exist telling them why it's important that you need to either pivot to this mind shift, why you need to consider this product or service, right? It's having the awareness, the education, and the following behind somebody getting to that conversion points. So with demand, Jen, you're creating that demand. You're getting high intent individuals that are going to your website and saying, hey, I'm actually interested, supply and demand, right? You're attracting those individuals who are saying, hey, I actually have a need and I know that you solve it and you have that awareness component with the individuals that are meeting you at that place. Mm -hmm. Lead gen as a fundamental approach is an outbound sales motion where both either from a sales perspective or from a lead perspective, you're going out and you're cold prospecting and you're hoping that individuals will spark their interest. And then you spend months trying to convince them to buy your product, to educate them on why. And in essence, you could be doing all of that if you just let marketing do their job. Right. So it enables sales cycles, demand gen enables sales cycles to go by quicker than a lead gen model. And it helps create a better partnership with sales teams as well, because sales are like, yo, this person is like super hot. Like I just got off this like disco mm-hmm. demo call with them and they get all pumped and they're excited and they're building that morale and that enthusiasm with marketing. Whereas with lead gen, they're just pointing fingers at each other saying, I'm going to send out this ebook download and I'm going to shoot this, um, this lead over to the sales team or the SDR and expect for them to follow up so that they can continue that cold prospecting and that convincing side of the selling. And then they're pointing fingers back at marketing. And it was like, oh, I'm not going to follow up with this because these are crap. Like, well, why are they crap? Because there's no intent behind them. Marketing is just outbound sales and then trying to send those leads over to the sales team to make them do their job. But it's not their job at that point to convince somebody that's marketing's job, to educate, to drive that awareness, that creation. So that's the way I like to explain the difference between the two. They're both generating stuff. One is just demand. One is just a set of leads with no intent. Uh I often think of it, too, as like it's like this thread that kind of goes through the whole thing, right? Because I do think that with Legion, I think you're right. It's like, oh, look, here are your MQLs, and now it's your job to convert yep. them. I mean, I do think there was something, I don't want to, like, dismiss too much, like, that that model, like, switching to, like, MQLs and SQLs. The development of that model was a big leap forward for marketing, I think, for digital marketing, because it did allow us to quantify what we were doing absolutely um and to tie it to revenue i think it was a necessary step absolutely a way to demand gen <laughs> like, right i don't think that i don't think that we could be here if we hadn't gone there if that makes sense yeah totally i agree with you but now it's time to like get out of that i think it's like time to sort of this is sort of that next evolution um i think in that same spirit i think i often as a content marketer I love demand gen, as I always like to say, along with its its cousin, uh, its equally misunderstood cousin, account based marketing. <laughs> like, right? Um, I, I think they both require a lot of really, really high quality content. Yep. Um, and I think that you cannot just put out back to like your uh, ebook example. You cannot just pump out junk and expect it to do to mean anything in a demand gen funnel. Mm-hmm. Right? You can 
do you, you can put out, you know, kind of like, it's like, is there a content marketing equivalent of vaporware? It's like where you thought you were getting an ebook and then you open it up and it's like a sales pitch. It's like, oh, there's nothing actually in here. This is just some really big print and some pictures. Um, it's like, you can't actually get away with that. Like in a yep. lead in model, you could, cause you're like, look, I got hundred people to download it. And they're all the people that you said you wanted. I got the and leads. It's all that matters. Model. <laughs> like that is total like that doesn't work so I like to produce high quality content and an effective like legit demand gen strategy requires a lot of it so it keeps me in business yeah and not only do you like to I think you do so I, shout out to your work <laughs> I know, I know. But, you know, it's like there's different pressures I do think it's changed I think it's like kind of changed that dynamic and like what people look for so ta let's talk about that let's talk a little bit about how content like what role does content play for you so when you sit down as a demand gen marketer and you're working out strategy, demand and strategy. When do you think about content and how? I actually start with content. Um, so mm -hmm. what I like to do is I meet with the content person. I say, are we aligned with our ICP? Are we aligned with our messaging? And are we aligned with the channels that we want to execute? Mm -hmm. At a minimum, that's how we're going to be able to actually produce anything that's valuable for the both of us, right? Uh -huh. If we're not aligned with our ICP, if we're not aligned, aligned with the channels that we want to produce, I mean, creating an ad for LinkedIn is way different than creating a webinar, a podcast, an ebook, a white paper, whatever pieces of content we want to do, the tone of voice, the objective out of them, it all varies, right? So I like to put together my go-to-market approach in terms of the channels that I would like to uh, take to market. And then I like to meet with the content person and say, are we aligned, right? What are the channels you would like to see? Is there anything that I'm missing? You know, where should we also consider? Um, and then from there, we talk about what is that right messaging to speak to these individuals. And that's where I like to partner with not only content, but also product. Um, and then this is when you take that extra step and you do market research. You start talking to individuals, your customers, individuals that can tell you actual feedback in terms of what worked to get them to actually already buy. Or what are some of the pain points you're seeing right now in market that you need to be focused on creating that content together? And not only do you kind of create that alignment between the internal departments on marketing but then you're also anything that you produce going to market is within the same voice the same consistency and with the objective in mind of us educating and aware and um, driving that awareness for our the prospects right the individuals that we're wanting to ultimately convert in, into customers so I've heard a lot of people say it's content versus demand gen because content's all things fluffy and awareness and blogs and ebooks and it, it's not it's not like that at all like they're the best partnership because anything in a funnel from awareness all the way down to customer enablement and optimizations, it demands content and in a different way based on where an individual is in their process with your company and your brand. Um, and so partnering in those aspects and really ensuring that messaging is aligned with the stage that they're at and the channel that you're wanting to go to market with um, is my recommendation on where to start. Yeah. It's interesting. Jared made a comment. He said, generation to me means creating demand, which is another way of looking at it. I love that because that's how I think of it too, which suggests it hadn't previously existed. So isn't a huge aspect of this market education? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Jared. It's like, especially if you are trying to sell, usually if you need to sell a new product or a new service, you've got to, before that, sell an idea. You've got to sell people on the idea that like you're offering them, like they have, they're experiencing a pain that like you could make go away or that you could improve their lives in some way um, through the use of this technology. And you're going to have to overcome that. And yes, I agree. And like, that's where I like to see content play that role. But it's like back up and sell the idea. If you've sold the idea, selling the product, the platform gets so much easier. Yeah, it really does. And to add to that, so the generation means creating demand, right? So in what I mentioned about creating and capturing demand, capturing demand is that 1% of the people who are actually in market. The creating demand is a 99% of people who have no idea you exist or think that you're just somebody else that can do the job and they don't care. You're, you're no different, right? So demand generation is not only from a business term in terms of creating that market awareness to your point, Jared, it's also creating the demand for your sales team for the business, for the revenue, for the objectives. So generation, demand generation is both for the capturing and creating, but, but both for the market awareness, as you mentioned, and then also for the development of the business. You also used another term I want us to stop and define for folks. Um, ICP, which stands for Ideal Customer Profile. And I have a question for you. What is the difference between an ICP and the persona that HubSpot so thoroughly trained us all to think about <laughs> right yeah. we, we probably we got personas and in audience work like I, that made sense to me and audio as a publisher you know as a journalist in the back 
what is the difference between an ICP and a persona? Yeah. So the way that I like to advise my clients on that is to look at what you want and what you're getting. That's a short yeah. answer. So what you want is saying, hey, who does our product solve? You talk to executive, you talk to the CEO, and we're like, oh, we created this product for HR executives or for product leaders, right? Or CTO, CIOs, whatever fluffy title they want to throw out there, who it's for. And then you go into your Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever CRM you have, and you pull the latest like one to three years of data, depending on what's available. And you look at how many of those were actually closed one. Are they the personas that you're wanting to do? What's the org size? What's the industry? What's the titles? Who's the influencer? Who's the decision maker? That's your ICP. That's where you should mold your go-to-market to of people who are in your sweet spot. And given, right, like they should mostly be aligned if you're having, we want to go this direction from the strategy top down and who you're actually landing. But I've actually found that it varies drastically. I've had some individuals say, we want to land enterprise customers with employee sizes of 10K or more. But their product can't support enterprise. They don't have like SSO capabilities. They don't even have enough licenses for like employees, uh, companies with that size of employees, right? And so when you look at their sweet spot, they're closing deals within three to 5K of um, employees, right? So that's a really big difference. And so ICP is individuals who are actually those who you want to land and those who actually like make sense for you to land those who are your sweet spot who actually buy who has the capabilities for your product so finding a, a balance between those two is the best way that i could say to marry those and as well as the difference <laughs> i like to push people on this too everybody starts off wanting to tell me it's for anybody and i'm like is it nope. though and then we dig in and then we'll get to that value prop for the business and then i start digging in on like well what's the value prop for the content which is often where you and i intersect because it's what for whom and if you've got a what for whom at the product level at the company level that needs to then show up again in the content which is if it does that then it'll support demand gen if it doesn't it is just fluff that is what makes it fluff it's the lack of clarity yep so let's um i want to talk about one of my favorite topics here right quick actually um you and i have discussed this we we don't we don't even necessarily always agree on like when to do this <laughs> like, and like we sometimes argue with each other back and forth to gate or not to gate so in demand gen one of the things demand gen is known for if leads were people downloading our things by the way someone downloading a white paper was never a lead they were never ever ever a lead i don't care what you got told 20 years ago <laughs> like, but when do we gate? In demand gen, demand gen is sort of known for saying, don't gate, let the content go free. Tell me why. So my opinion is to not gate. Um, and the reason for that is, again, going back to the fundamental approach of the reason why we're creating the piece of content. If you're wanting to create that piece of content for that market awareness, the best thing that you can do is get that consumption for that awareness, right? Gating is just an extra, ladi- uh, extra layer of friction that gets added to somebody consuming that piece of content. And a lot of like modern buyers today know that when they get, submit their information on a form, they're going to get bombarded by a salesperson probably like five times because a lot of companies are still in that lead gen model. Um, and so really having... Um, just and the, removing that extra layer of friction. And I see Tyler's comment here. It doesn't always create unnecessary friction. Correct. It doesn't, right? But it could. And so are you willing to take that risk? It might, right? Um, and then also, you could also slice and dice it in multiple different ways that just make it like from a go-to-market approach that much more feasible to where you don't have to make sure that you're sending it to a landing page. You're sending it to somewhere else so that somebody can download it. A great example for that is LinkedIn. A lot of LinkedIn is in feed. Like I think... 0.4% of people actually click on ads um, to go to a landing page to download it. So the main strategy for LinkedIn um, marketing approach is to make sure that you're telling that story in feed. It gets a lot harder when you're having to gate something and the value is behind that click. You're going to lose the majority of the individuals at you know just from that one channel. So I don't want to say that you're going to lose all of the downloads and the consumption if you gate it. My opinion is you're just you're enabling individuals more to just educate themselves make the process themselves and when they're ready they'll talk to you they'll come to your website they'll have that education and awareness behind it to where they're asking valuable questions that the team can then take the time to answer and help move them down Um, in my opinion having like just somebody submit the form for me to have their information doesn't necessarily 
mean a whole lot. Um, we could, I could nerd out over this forever, right? Like some people are like, oh, I, I want the sales trigger notification so I could follow up if they're an ABM account, they're a target. Like there's so many like conversations that can go from this. But with technology nowadays, all of that's possible without gating it. Mm -hmm. I'll end it there. <laughs> I would say I noticed here Tyler, uh, I think my, my, my Tyler also noted that 80% of the ebooks that he downloads are just sales pitches. And that is super disappointing. Like don't, that's the bait and switch. I'm really not okay with that. There are times when I think that it is appropriate to create gates, but like to me at this point, the bar is so high for sharing that information. Like you've really got to be giving me some kind of report, some kind of proprietary insights that I am so desperate to have that I'm like, fine, you can call me. Like, <laughs> you know, like that's, there's got to be something in there. There's got to be something in it for me, which is where Absolutely. I think that like, if you can create truly like robust, meaningful assessments, and then what people are giving up their email address for is the right ability to get a tailored assessment back. Mm -hmm. Like people are comfortable with that. That still doesn't mean you should call them. So usually in my mind, if somebody that what they're really all they're saying is this information at this moment seems compelling enough for me to give up my contact information. That's all they're telling you. That is their yeah. intent. Um, what you could follow up with there is more similar information. So if you've got their email, that doesn't mean follow up and try to get me a call. I've gotten calls from people. This is where I know they're just not deploying the software well because I've downloaded things. I'm already a customer. And I've downloaded something and I get a, three seconds later an automated email from a BDR. And I'm like, you, how does your system not know that I already give you thousands upon thousands of dollars a year? What is this? Like, That's the fortunate part of, of B2B marketing. What if you got a trigger? Somebody said, I was like, hey, one of our customers downloaded this. That's a useful bit of information for my, my customer success manager. Not to like try to sell me, but just be like, hey, what's going on? Like, that's helpful. So, yes. That's helpful. <laughs> don't, don't try to sell me something I already bought. <laughs> like, so that's, um, that's kind of like, again, again, we could talk about this all day. Um, let's talk about metrics, you know, because over a couple minutes, you know, we really should be wrapping up here, but we'll take a couple minutes because I think this is where people get stuck. Because right now, because again, I do think that the MQL, SQL, like that whole model did allow marketers finally to have a way, digital marketers, to track, the, measure the impact of our work and say, look, I am generating stuff over here. I am building up our contact database. I am building awareness. And so when, and so people are comfortable there. And then we often report into, even if it's not our CMO, we report into like a CEO or operational people, just other folks inside the business who do not understand demand gen. And they want you to tell them, well, how many leads did you generate? And you, Janelle, can't say that question. What is the number that you do give them? What are the, the sort of the three numbers that you would point them to as meaningful? Yeah, that's a great question. Everything ties to educating your existing audience and driving revenue for the business. Um, and so the way that I outline those conversations to begin with is not setting the content up for failure by saying we're going to create X amount of leads. It's having that understanding of the objective of this is to educate and the consumption percentage goal is what we're going after. The overall um, inquiries of interest is what we're going after. And a great way to measure this is just by adding a how did you hear about us on your uh -huh. form. Required field, open text, mandatory. You'll be surprised on the things that you get in from there. You'll start seeing if you have like a personal brand on LinkedIn or if you start promoting this piece of content, you'll have people say, oh, I heard about you from your podcast. I heard about you from your LinkedIn feed. I heard about you from this webinar y'all did. I heard about you, right? And it's it's that free flowing. And then you can start using that to map into the opportunities and the conversations, the meetings that your sales team is having and make that conversation to your executive team, the CEO about revenue. All they care about is how much and when. So if you can deliver those conversation in terms of here's what marketing is doing to deliver X amount of pipeline in this amount of time frame, they're going to be a little more hands off in terms of how many pieces of lead, how many leads did this one piece of content create? They're going to start looking at the broader strategy of marketing as a whole. So, you know what's interesting to me is that we're both B two B marketers, right? But this is in many ways much more parallel to a B2C framework. Mm -hmm. um, and we've always said we're very different. But I can tell you all that Procter & Gamble, you know, historically hasn't sold toothpaste thinking that they can track. Like attribution, this like level of like, oh, this lead came in here and this happened here. It's like they've never had that. The right? obsession oh, of attribution. 
Yeah, it's like they they instead say, okay, we ran this campaign and we can see that when we ran this one in this market, we sold a lot more mm -hmm. of this toothpaste, right? We can see that people are talking about this toothpaste. So, so we might not be able to say exactly they saw this thing, you, you know, I mean, there's ways that we can do this. In some ways, we've almost shifted over toward like what our, our friends over in B2C do. Um, I also think it's interesting. We, we tend to like in the old model, marketing stopped at, if you're in that legion model, it's like my job was to build aware brand awareness, which was treated as fluffy and like, and everybody comes in and says, oh, we don't want to do brand awareness. We want to spend all our money on legion. And I'm like, legion without brand awareness is really, really hard. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think that that's, a, I think that's part of like the process where people get thrown and then our responsibility kind of ended after sales in a demand gen model. We can think about further, think about business problems like down the chain. Um, so now you're like, when they came in, how fast did they close, right? And when they, when they, we closed them, how, and we had them, did they refer people? So I think, what is it? Is I want to say that like Refine Labs, I think is, and I want to make sure I'm attributing this correctly. Then they talk about deal velocity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what does that mean? What does deal velocity mean? Yeah. So essentially it means at one point when you consider them in a pipeline, a lot of companies consider that like a stage two. Stage one is like meeting books. Stage two is like there's actually interest behind it. Now they're considered in pipe all the way until they close. How quickly does it move from stage to stage to stage until it gets closed? That's the velocity of it. Um, and so from a demand standpoint, when you're bringing individuals who are raising their hands saying, hey, I love you guys. I'm ready to buy. Then from there, the velocity goes away quicker because you already have the buy-in. From lead Gen, right? You're spending that time trying to convince individuals and talk to them about why it's important. The velocity gets drawn out. That's why you see enterprise sales cycles of like uh -huh. six to two years, like six months to two years. Whereas demand gen sometimes in B2B world can actually be only 90 days. Like a world does exist where things could be better. And the reason why that is to your point in terms of like the, the B2C is because we're all consumers. As I mentioned, demand gen is taking that marketing lens off. It's making sure that you're taking that seller's hat off, right? Are you on Amazon? I'm on Amazon. <laughs> Do you like Amazon? I love Amazon, right? We're competing with Amazons in this B2B world. We're spoiled rotten by having everything about me, 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 now, 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 now. And then B2B companies expect them to go through this long drawn out process. And people just they don't buy that way anymore. They're spoiled rotten by that B2C world, to your point, and then they're just going to get frustrated. So uh -huh. to your point, that lead gen model worked back in, I don't know, 2013, 2016, when it was popular. Uh -huh. But since then, so many companies have innovated and spoiled us rotten, myself included, to where we demand everything just at a, a faster scale and just way more personalized and all things like selfish, you know? Uh -huh. um, and so it's, it's time to make that modernized approach into self-serving individuals and keeping them within that um that model that they're used to it's just going to go by way fast way faster so i do think it's really funny you mentioned too that it goes faster we talk about the funnel and because you said you were full funnel i want to use another refine labs chris walker term here those of you who aren't following him you, you should like absolutely I mean, should i give them a lot of credit for like basically making this such a huge part of our conversation in marketing 100 percent um, it's like, did, that, did they invent a category? I mean, I don't know if they invented it, but if they didn't invent it, they are the reason <laughs> like it, it, it made it into our heads. But he talks about the dark funnel. Yeah. And the dark funnel being a thing that is, at this point, untrackable. Do you know, what is the dark funnel in demand gen? Yes, the dark funnel is essentially where individuals are educating themselves without your knowledge. And that's another reason why I'm a supporter of the ungated content, right? So when somebody is... Uh, consuming a piece of content and they've never heard of you before and they read it and they're like, oh, that's interesting. And then they go to LinkedIn and they look a little bit more, they see a little bit more and they're like, okay, cool. That's really interesting. Now they're a part of the Slack community, right? And they're talking to somebody else and they see a promotion for a podcast that talks about this topic that they're interested in. And all of a sudden they went from not knowing anything about you or your business all the way through now being interested, now being aware, right? From there, they start consuming the content as much as they can because they're on that board, they're on that train, and they're working through it. And all of a sudden, they say, two years later, if it takes that long, sometimes the need is right there, right? Then they can start saying, hey, this is really interested, I want to learn more. Then they go to your website, then they start looking a little bit more at what you do, and then they convert, and they submit that demo form. 
Because they're net new to your website and there's no cookie associated with it, your attribution software is going to say that it's from direct traffic or organic because that's what they typed into Google for the very first time. But okay. you're missing all the other components that push them through that funnel journey from LinkedIn to podcasts to Slack communities to everything else that people are doing right now. And they went through that funnel all by themselves. Nobody talked to them. Nobody sold them. Nobody outbound nothing. It was just based on the content that was available, This the interest sparking that was part of it, which is another reason why content is really important, right? And having that right messaging. But they've, they, they went through the funnel. That's a dark funnel in terms of by the time they reach the attribution software, it's too late. Mm -hmm. It's emails, it's phone calls, it's messages, it's so much of that. And it is self-directed. One of my pet peeves, though, is when I get to the end of that. This is why demand gen is more than just a marketing strategy. I love that you kicked this off talking about it being this customer-centered mindset. But the worst thing in the world for me, like I would just say as a buyer, as a software buyer, as a business owner, is when I go through a process where I have self-educated myself and I have availed myself of all these things out there. And I've had conversations. I've read the reviews like on Trust Radius. I've read you know, I've, I've talked to peers, like, I know that I actually want this software, right? Like, I am to the point, I know, and then they say, I put in, I was like, okay, and they'll say, okay, well, you have to get this demo, and you're going to have to get vetted and pre-qualified by, yeah. like, and then they'll put a BDR, SDR on the call with me, and I'm like, oh, I know more about your product than you do. Can you please just take my money? Can we skip this part? <laughs> like, like, you know, there's so many of these processes that are built to slow us down like why are we slowing buyers down and so i would say if your business if the sales side of your business and the onboarding side of your business is still based on this gatekeeping mm -hmm. demand gen is probably not for you i mean i'm just gonna say that like i don't know like i don't want to discourage you should learn more about this mindset but like organizationally i don't know if you would disagree with that janelle but like i've never seen a company that gate kept at that level, right? Where it's like, you must talk to a BDR and then you can talk to an SDR and then we'll allow you to talk to a sales account representative. If you're going to do that to me, do not do, do not, do not pretend you are, you know, demand. Customer centric. Yeah, yeah. You're not doing demand. Don't do demand because you're, you're just confusing me. Yep. Now you're just confusing me. In order for demand gen to be successful, it's an entire org buy-in. It's an entire leadership direction. It's a go-to-market team structure. A lot of companies think that they can just create a demand gen department or like a head of demand gen individual and they're going to solve all the revenue problems. Don't work that way because to your point, there's so many other fundamental items that are wrong with the way that they do business for, or I should say not wrong, but you know, that provide that level of friction um, that just they sabotage demand gen efforts. I'm bringing yeah. high quality people to your website and all of a sudden, to your point, do you have to get pre-qualified? What? Like I was so enthused to see a demo, like give me a freaking demo, you know, like that's another great way for people to bounce. Um, so have you recorded? <laughs> yeah, just send me something i'll do it on my own yeah because it is a paradigm shift it is a paradigm Absolutely. shift. like it is more than just i'm gonna call this demand gen and it's the same thing but yeah it's like please just can the, the demo should also be <laughs> like, at least the first one at least the first one <laughs> like, so any i guess one anybody have any questions i know we are over time here and truly janelle and i could talk about this all day and we will stick around here for a few minutes so if you've got any questions um, if you want to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I've got a couple of quick questions for you, Janelle, around yeah. this. Um, Let's dive in. So, all right. So a lot of times when you're coming in and you're shifting to this demand gen model, as we were just alluding to, this is a change management initiative. Mm -hmm. So to come in as a demand gen marketer, um, I mean, because you've had some ridiculous conversations before. It's like, well, I'm not always about when you told me about the trade show people who try to pitch you for your demand gen strategy. Oh, <laughs> like, those are always great. Right, right. It's like, so I mean, what, what did they tell you? Like, so they came to you and they were like, they tell you they just want to give you the lead. I don't know. You, you tell the story better than I do, but then I would. I had, like, <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this is a great story and a great example of what not to do. Um, I had an individual book time on my calendar, um, just found my calendar online or stole it from my website. I, I don't know how they got it. I've never heard of the person before and they booked time on my calendar. And uh, I have that. How did you hear about us uh, for my business field on that calendar booking link? And they just put growth. 
Okay, that could mean something in demand gen, right? I did a quick like search on who they are, did my background and my research, right? Preparing for this call. And I knew that they were probably more of like, and eh, like just trying to sell me something, probably not the most qualified, but respectfully, I took the call and just wanted to hear them out. Um, and then I um, joined the call and immediately they dove straight into all the things that they could do for me and my business, which didn't have anything to do with my business. Um, and then they wanted me to then buy all these other things from their partners. And I was like, okay, but you know nothing about me. If you knew anything about me, you would know that this wouldn't be a good fit. Like you literally just wasted my time. Mm -hmm. I also, I love the what the people, is it compatible that outbound, you know, the endless uh, sales, uh, the LinkedIn messages we get right now, just asking for five minutes of our time. Is that demand, Jen? <laughs> is that a demand gen strategy is that compatible with demand gen it, it could be compatible because one of the things that i stick behind is that demand gen isn't everything that a company should be doing i you uh -huh. still have your sales team doing outbound. And the unfortunate part is those type of tactics are still part of the sales outbound. Demand gen with that customer centricity is trying to find ways to optimize those processes so they're not as inconvenient and like unpersonalized or whatever, you know, issues that are wrong with them. Um, but right now, the pivot between demand gen and sales outbound, we're still trying to find a way to kind of connect those and marinate those. But those I would say are a little more of like a sales outbound tactic that definitely need to be improved with that customer centricity hat in mind. Cool. Sorry. Any other questions? Any other questions anybody have? Because otherwise we can wrap it up. All right. And I don't want to let everybody know, yes, we will have the recording available on demand. Yes, this was only supposed to be 30 minutes. But as we warned y'all, we could talk about gating and ungating content alone for an hour. So, <laughs> like, um, and come to different conclusions like, from what we started with, um, depending on the piece and the goal. So if you have any questions, you can certainly send us notes as well. Um, you can find me and Janelle on LinkedIn. Um, send us, you know, um, Jill's specialty is B2B SaaS, demand gen, you know, sort of mapping out the strategy for that. Mine is the content side of the house. So figuring out all that self-serve, self-education stuff that has to get created, like that's, that's our part. Um, and I do think this is going to be an emerging area that we're going to continue to figure out how these things actually work, because I think more people are interested in this model. I think we're using this terminology I think we don't always have the same definitions of what we mean by them, but I also think it's a paradigm shift. This is a paradigm shift. So I think my last question for you, Janelle, before we log off is, what is your advice to the marketer sitting here listening to this who says, I'm all in, I love this. I think this would work well for our market, for our customers. I'm not sure if I can get my boss, you know, or my colleagues, like on board, like I've got to ch help change them. How can you help make that change? Like if you, what are, how can you approach that? How do you change people to, you know, yeah. How do you get everybody else on board? Yeah, like, I've actually had to do that in-house internally, so I can give you some uh -huh. great advice. I'll try and keep it short because I know we're trying to wrap up. Yeah. Um, but walk through your own company website, your own selling process by yourself without your marketing or seller's hat lens on and document everything that frustrates you, everything that's wrong with it, everything that you would love to change and be brutal right? And then present that to your head of marketing, VP marketing, whoever you report into, and then say, listen, we are causing way more friction than we need to. Everybody's about conversion rate op optimizations, CROs, right? Wow. So talk to them about how we can improve their conversion rates, how we can improve the amount of meetings that the SDR team is going to be getting or AEs, whatever metrics that your business is measured on, find ways to connect what you what you found, what you discovered to how you can increase those KPIs, those metrics, and then say, give me, I don't know, a quarter to test it. Let's try this. Let's A-B test it, whatever you can get for that buy-in. And then do not go dark within that period. Every week, two weeks, month, what, however long it takes to, for you to acquire that information, broadcast the hell out of it. Tell the world, tell everybody, tell as many people as you can, tell the people higher up from your boss. This is what we're doing. That's how you get the buy-in, in short. Uh -huh. It's interesting too, I think with metrics, we talk about measuring stuff. It's like, so that assumes you're in an organization that already makes decisions based on data. Yep. <laughs> like, so Which that's most not, do. 
Right, right. Well, I would, I would argue like most people go looking for data that backs up what they wanted to do anyway, which means that that's what you too can do as a demand gen marketer. <laughs> you can go take a look and see if you can find a way to make it simple. I think it has to be simple. I think that's the other thing is we can also get down into some terms and some measurements around velo like deal velocity and pipeline and how those things get determined. But if you can bring it down to like one or two numbers that are really tied to revenue. I mean, I think matter. if you can really, you got to find out what matters. And I can tell you in the end, what matters is revenue. Mm -hmm. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Your job is, is to get people through the, get them, get them in the door, make them aware, get them in the door, move them through the door faster, and then make sure that they have a good, ex a good enough experience that they bring in other people with them. Yep. That's it. That's the marketer's job, no matter what's in their title. So, yeah. Burn out. Kind of interesting thing. So thank you so much, Janelle. Um, anything else you want to say as we wrap up here? No, thank you, you know, so much. Good. Yeah, this is really fun. My favorite topics. Always a good time with you, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye.